We are not responsible for your behavior. We believe in common sense. You're listening to News Talk on Strange But True Radio, episode 16 of 2022, with Philip Jones and myself, Philip Keeler. On tonight's show in the UK, the European Court of Human Rights stops the first flight of asylum seekers to Rwanda. And in Brazil, human remains have been found in the search for a British journalist missing in the Amazon. Here's what's trending around the world. In Ukraine, thousands of people are still trapped in the city of Severodonetsk. According to the UN, essential supplies are now running out. They claim many of the population are keeping safe in bunkers beneath the city's chemical plant. To Nigeria now, and police there are investigating a reported mass abduction in the capital, Abuja. It's after one of the hostages took to social media to get help, kidnapping the for ransom by armed gangs are becoming increasingly common across the country. In India, a 10-year-old boy has been rescued from a well. Rescuers say he was trapped underground for five days. Rahul Sahu was provided with oxygen throughout and is said to be doing well now. And in the UK, a tiny tree frog has been found in a bag of bananas more than 4,000 miles from its home in the Dominican Republic. A shopper discovered the amphibian when unpacking fruit he bought from a local supermarket in South London. To our top story then uh, tonight, in the UK, the European Court of Human Rights stops the first flight of asylum seekers to Rwanda. Uh, The UK government are set to appeal. Uh, Floundering Prime Minister Boris Johnson has even suggested he could take us out of the ECHR, an idea not shared by many in his party. Um... Phil, another story where our government looks bad, some would say even unkind. Why is Priti Patel and and Boris and her Conservative government wanting to export asylum seekers to Rwanda? Um, They're doing it because they're saying it's deter refugees from coming to the UK. So basically they're saying, why would you come to the UK if... refugees from the UK. Just get that microphone that's a bit what... closer to your mouth if that's all right. It's so uh, it's slowly disappearing. So um it, it's it's used as a deterrent basically. Um but what's going to well, happen yes. when they they go out there? They're going to be sat in B&Bs technically doing nothing. Well, that's an interesting question because human rights in Rwanda are not the biggest priority. No. People are people are abducted and tortured if they have opposing political views to the ruling party. For example, freedom of speech is quashed. Right to privacy is not adhered to, amongst other things. So, Rwanda human rights record is terrible. Absolutely, is terrible. People don't. People seem to be brushing over this, saying, "Oh, it's all right. It's not all right at all." So this is very dangerous, but what happened... So the government is saying, basically, if we deport everybody to another country, they won't They won't come here because England will... UK will no longer be the land of milk and honey for the refugee because they're going to be sent to Africa. Yeah. So rather than come here, they won't be spending their money on catching a boat 
um, across the water illegally to land on this land on our, our shores and then seek asylum. It's most bizarre though so, because I, I'm pretty sure that we have asylum seekers in the UK from Rwanda. Oh, that's an interesting point. I didn't know that. And it, yes, of course, this is my point it, it, because they have a terrible human rights record. So there, why there would we? Why would we take them? Who opposed the government? Yeah. Two women who opposed the government were put in jail for a year. Yeah. It's it's madness. Is it surprising though that Boris and his cronies are doing this? It's a big. It's just a big headline grabbing story, surely. To divert? Are they they diverting? So there's an underlying group of people in this country who voted Brexit because they didn't want any more immigrants. Since Brexit, we've got more immigrants than we had before Brexit, so that didn't work. Right. So now they're trying to appease the right wing faction of the proletariat who supports the removal of asylum seekers. And also there are many people who support the removal of our human rights. So what they're saying is that so the human right, the European Convention of Human Rights Court at Strasbourg said there is a, a man called KN who may seek there's a real risk of irreversible harm if he's deported to Rwanda so he could be murdered by the system in Rwanda if he if he's deported there okay so that's a real danger and that triggered other legal challenges for the other six uh, refugees who were due to be deported to Rwanda because their lives may be in danger so that needs to be reviewed and people need to decide whether or not there's a real danger of them being deported to Rwanda because that is a defi- definitive breach of their human rights okay because you've got a right to a fair trial and you've got a right to life so that we because we don't have a capital punishment in this country thank god so then what you've got you've got a government now who lord G- gate has just resigned because he's frustrated over party gate and the fact that the 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 prime minister has broken the law and as such has broken the ministerial code and as such should resign so the prime minister says well i'll change the ministerial code so i don't have to resign so that's what he's done so he just changes the rules according to what he wants at the time, which is what a dictator would do in 1984. And now he wants to come out the European Court of Human Rights. And now Change this that. man, whose ethics, two ethics advisors, have resigned in within two years. Alex Allen in November 2020, because he proposed that Pretty Patel should be sacked for bullying civil servants because she's a pretty dreadful individual. <laughs> and so he was res- he resigned over that. Then you've got Lord Gate as well. Within two years, he's resigned. So then you've got a, a, a prime minister who has no policies, according to Rory Stewart. He, he spends all his time defending one scandal after another, so he mm. hasn't got any time to develop any real policies. No. And he, one day he says, oh, that's fantastic, let's go with it, and then the next day he changes his mind. He's, but he's, in, he's powerful, so he gets away with it, and he, he, this really has to stop because it's destroying our position in the world, as far as I can tell. And this same government with the puppet cabinet who are really a bit like robots if you listen to Dominic Raab or Liz Truss speak they're robotic they've got a script and they stick to the script and that's all they have to say because they don't really have any understanding of anything as far as I can tell apart from maybe Liz Truss knows a bit about cheese and uh, Dominic Raab knows a little bit about karate that's it I mean they're not they're not clever people and they're in the cabinet. They may have degrees, they may have done all these things, but they're not clever people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So they, this is the same government who now wants to remove our remove us from the European Convention of Human Rights, take away our human rights. They want, they're threatening our human rights. This government are doing that to exactly what Hitler did in the 1930s he the first thing he did was to destroy freedom of speech which is exactly in what's going on in Rwanda that you're not allowed freedom of speech in Rwanda yeah Nazis took away freedom of speech they burnt all books they told if you said the wrong thing you could get arrested and murdered in jail in Nazi Germany 
we have no freedom of speech in the United Kingdom because if you work in an office and you say the wrong thing or you write the wrong thing by email, you lose your job. You get sacked. So you have to be very, very careful what you say at work now. So that's our freedom of speech is gone. So that's one human right that's been eroded easily. That's e- easily observable. And what's next? So now our right to our right to live and work in twenty six other countries has been removed by Brexit. Because mm. I'll say that's a that's a they've taken away massive right a massive um, element of our citizenship's been taken away. Our citizenship as members of the European Community. That's horrific if you think about it in those terms. You know, they've done that, and um, now they they want to remove our our position on the European in the European Convention of Human Rights so that they can ride, ride roughshod over whoever they want to. Mm. Terrible. So we're in a very dangerous position. So basically we've got an unethical Prime Minister who lie, who's known to be a liar surrounded by puppets who will do anything he says without question, apparently, mm-hmm. who now want to take away our, our, our human rights. This is a very, very dangerous position. And the government wasting our money yet again because uh, do you know how much it cost for that flight and, and all the uh, uh, things surrounding that to go to Rwanda, which was cancelled, obviously? The flight. The flight's nine hundred thousand pounds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just cannot believe Seven people, a lot of money. And these people, the people, who, there are people out there who don't think that we should have human rights. And the reason for that is because they turn around and say, "Well, there was that bloke in Jordan we couldn't deport. Well, we did deport him eventually, and it was one person." Mm. So you're saying you want to take away all of our human rights because we've got a handful of people who may or may not be international criminals. And anyway, even if they are international criminals, we can, we don't. why would we want to deport them if, we, if they're going to their death? Do we want a government that, that supports murdering people? Do no. we want people... Do we want a government that supports uh, sending refugees to a regime which, who, who uh, torture political dissidents uh, and if, if, if these are dangerous uh, asylum si- uh, seekers they could actually get lost in the system of rwanda and then suddenly they're they're out yeah. and they nobody's got any tracks on them so it, the, the whole this whole thing is is madness really well it's the whole government's madness if you think about it you've got a government think about what i just said The Prime Minister has no time to develop any real important policies or strategies because he's spending his whole time defending himself from one scandal to the next. He can't govern. And you've got Priti Patel who's disappointed that she can't send someone to their potential death. This is Strange But True Radio. He's Phil Jones. I'm Phil Keeler. We'll be back talking about the deaths in the Amazon in Brazil next. Do stay with us.
This is Strange But True Radio. We are a podcast talking about trending stories and uh, and slagging off the Tory governments in the UK who are abysmal, really. Um, if you go to our Twitter site, uh, our handle, of course, on Twitter is StrangeBTR. You can see uh, an interesting speech uh, by uh, Yvette Cooper MP uh, taking down... Uh, uh, the Rwanda policy and and basically having a real go at Pretty Patel, who is uh, a Patel is basically reduced to gurning and making funny faces. It's actually quite an interesting clip. So go to our Twitter page right now. Uh, we're at Strange BTR to listen to Yvette Cooper, an MP I've always always uh, enjoyed listening to, and uh, speaks a lot of sense. Right now, though, we're going to Brazil and human remains have been found in the search for a British journalist missing in the Amazon. Dom Phillips vanished with Bruno Pereira on the 5th of June. Now, police in Brazil say the main suspect in that killing has taken them to the spot where they were buried. Um, Phil, the pair went missing on a remote stretch of the Itacoi River. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'm probably not. Uh, Northeastern Brazil, basically, in the region of that. Is this a dangerous area for for Westerners? Uh, Yes. Yeah. And is this, this an area that you've actually been to as well? Well, I've been through the whole, I've been right the way across Brazil on the Amazon. So this is one of the tributaries that I'm not aware of. However, what we have to realise is that in the in this particular area, there are 11 uncontacted groups. So they could be quite dangerous. What happens in the Amazon is you have various different tribes who live along and it, the river and in internally within the jungle. Mm. And some are quite friendly and civilized and others are very dangerous and will kill you and eat you yeah so it depends on the depends on the culture of that particular tribe so some of them are actually quite pleasant and some of them are very unpleasant yeah if you meet the unpleasant ones <clears throat> then you're dead i've actually met cannibals in northern peru in the amazon regions which are well not sorry in the jungle up in the northern part of peru in the Mat valley they were quite polite there was only two of them most of them were hidden but we couldn't see them yeah and, um, i found out after we we'd chatting with these guys um that they they have uh they will have a court for example and um if you st- say if you steal a cow and they found you guilty of stealing a cow, they'll kill you, whack you over the head with a with a very fast rock launcher, and then they'll um, eat you. Wow. Okay. So, so it can be quite dangerous. So basically, yes. I mean, it is dangerous. However, in this case, the two, the person who's been discovered to be who's admitted um, shooting and murdering these two people is a fisherman. Mm. And this is an area where they transport cocaine so they're fighting over the they they may be fighting over the it may not be that they're just killing them it may be that they felt that their their uh, transit of cocaine was threatened and that's why they killed them because at the moment there doesn't seem to be any motive as to why they were killed no and, I, and it could be gone what i understand is journalists um so the, these are journalists working in in brazil for a company i believe called band tv it's a station out in sao paulo uh tv station um and, and quite often journalists are targeted in brazil uh from from sort of drug gang gangs and things like that aren't they well we don't know. It's really difficult to tell. I mean, Pilado, the guy who's died, sorry, who's been, um, says that he's confessed, his family said that he denied wrongdoing and had been tortured by police in attempts to get a confession. Um, indigenous people who were with Mr. Phillips and Mr. Pereira, the, I think they're the two died, have said Pilado brandished a rifle at them on the day before the disappearance. Mm. But 
we don't know what the truth is because we don't know how corrupt the police are and it could be that they died they died because they were threatening the a very lucrative trade which is the transport of cocaine mm. i think that's the that the most likely problem i mean when i when i actually traveled the entire <laughs> length of the amazon <laughs> i had a few scrapes along the way and well i did actually i got in some very dangerous situations in retrospect i think how the how did i get away with that mm. anyway and survive but it's a lawless place and it's so du it's so distant from anywhere you can off somebody and make them disappear and no one will ever find out how it, it, no one could ever prove it yeah so how these guys have been proven to be the murderer of these people i don't know it's very difficult for that to happen yeah yeah you exactly so why are they being taken to task by the police and how did they get caught and why would they what would their motive be for killing two journalists there is these are not members of a tribe in the jungle that are a bunch of cannibals. They're not. They're fishermen. Yeah. So why would a fisherman, what motive is there for him? There isn't, doesn't appear to be any, which is vital in murder case, really. There has to be some reason why you want to murder someone. You don't just kill someone for no reason. In fact, in, two, in this case, two people. Then there's an accusation by the police saying, but accusation against the police saying that they may, be, may have tortured the guy who's admitted doing it. So, we just don't know. It's all up in the air. Yeah, yeah. Well, what was the no, most there dangerous is time? Gang, there is gang violence in the area. Yeah. So Because gangs, are, they're uh, trying to control the waterways to ship cocaine. And if that's going on, then it's highly likely that the police are involved in well, as well. What was the most dangerous time for you when you were um, uh, going f down the Amazon in, in, in the, on, on the boat? What, what happened to you? Well, lots of different occasions, I suppose, in retrospect, were very, very dangerous. One was <clears throat> when I stopped in a port in a shanty town in Brazil. Um, I asked one of the guys who was on the boat if he knew anywhere, anywhere I could get a beer, and he said, yeah, follow him, come with me in five minutes. So we w walked out of the port gate where the where the dock basically we walked out of the dock which has a security guard on the gate i knew not to turn left because if i, I was told don't walk any further down here because you'll get robbed if you do i said okay so i walked along with the guy from the boat who was a member of the crew and we went into this bar and it was the end of, it was a it was a cup final and that region won the game and i sat around and we had loads of beers at the end of from bottles at a table i was the only white guy in the bar and so there was obviously it was a bit bit vibrant because their team had just won thankfully yeah. and um, everybody was jumping around there's a big celebration then it quietened down after the game was over it was dark outside i had about 300 meters to get back to the security of the dock and they handed me a bill for every beer at the table they wanted me to pay for everything Wow. So I did a lot of money. I mean, I had a lot of, I did, I had enough money to get to North. I was going up to the Northern Delta to try and cross the border into French Guyana and I needed whatever money that I'd got. And they wanted to take pretty much all the money I had. Wow. So I had a bag on the floor which had my valuables in it, but I didn't want to, I wasn't going to tell them that's where all my valuables were. So they, they gave me this thing and I looked at them and there was no way of me getting any more money before I got on the boat. And I, I thought, how am I going to get out of this one? And I'm not paying. Yeah. So I'm not paying all of that. I'm not paying for everybody. And the guy, they just looked at me like you're paying cause you're the gringo. <laughs> and, um, I said, I'm not paying. And they said, you are paying. And I said, well, eventually I just put my hand in my pocket and took out whatever was in my hat in my pocket and i said that's all the money i've got and so they accepted that i said i haven't got any more money so then i had to get out of this bar and get to look, get to the dock security of the dock and the, the street that street in this shanty town was full of people milling around and you know i i so i i just walked out with the bloke from the boat and i was really annoyed with him but i couldn't really say anything with hit against him because he was my security to get back to the boat to be seen walking with someone for me was very important at that time so 
and I because I knew it was dangerous. And so I walked as I walked got out and walked out of the bar, having not paid paid less than half the bill that they wanted me to pay, which worked out about six quid. Yeah. It wasn't very much money, but six quid was all up was make or break to get to the French border, if you see what I mean, because I didn't have much cash left. So then. <clears throat> As I walked out, I heard a sound behind me, and this massive big black guy came flying up towards me and started shouting, give me all your money. Wow. So I squared up to him and put my face right up against his and said, in no uncertain terms, that I'd given him all the money that I'd got in Spanish. They all speak Portuguese. I just spoke to him in Spanish in a very aggressive manner, and I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit this guy as hard as I can yeah. if he doesn't back down. And um, he wasn't expecting me to be so aggressive towards him. He's bigger than me. Yeah, yeah. And so I just went right up to his face and I told him in Spanish, in quite strong terms, go go away, go away, <laughs> old boy, because, you know, I really haven't got any more money. I've told you money and I'm not going to give you any more. <laughs> so toodle tip. And um, he backed down and walked off. Yeah. Yeah. So that was quite lucky, and then I got back to the boat, and I was okay. I, you know, went to sleep in my hammock. But it was that was a potentially really very very dangerous situation. But that wasn't the most dangerous situation I got into. Were you expecting any danger when you when you booked this flight and to do this uh, adventure? Uh, yeah. Was it in the back well, of your I, mind? Well, not really. I mean. I, when I've been in South America, generally speaking, I have been in very dangerous situations most of the time. Yeah. So, for example, when I was living in the mountains in Peru for 35 days at one, in one stretch, um, you know, obviously we'd go down to town sometimes and then we'd go back up to live in the village. My entire time whilst I was in the mountains, I, my life was in danger, yeah, yeah, all the time. Yeah. But from the people in the village, but from the authorities hmm. interesting because the last person who was in the same situation as me was found with his face down in the river wow because they murdered mm. wow without giving without a spoiler a spoiler alert on the book a peruvian diary which i wrote describes my time of 35 days in the mountains in peru where i went to build a dormitory for the children so they could all go to school excellent now when i was there something happened which meant that i had to defend or i chose to defend the community of people who are very poor by defending the community i had to go up against the authorities without them knowing it was me and the last guy who spoke up against the authorities in public disappeared after a car accident a minor car accident and they found him two weeks later face down in the river oh wow so what they said to me is if you decide you're going to do anything to defend the community in effect you must never speak out in public ever if you speak out in public you may disappear so basically everything that i said or did to protect the community i did in secret very good. Then I ended up writing a contract in Spanish for the community to so that they could rebut any attack made against them by the authorities. Mm. It was 13 years ago, and I'm still in contact with them, and I'm still alive, thankfully. <laughs> and you still go out and there, I'm don't still, you, occasionally? I'm still, defending, I'm still defending that community. Yeah. No, that's good. That's very good. I give them legal advice. What's your book called again, Phil? It's called A Peruvian Diary, and it's by Philip J.S. Jones, published by Austin McCauley. And it's a good book. book. It's it's got very, well, I'm blowing my own trump, but the reviews are very good. I would recommend the listener to have a look at it. Have a look at A Peruvian Diary, look at the reviews. That's it for this edition of Strange But True Radio. News talk for a mixed up generation with Philip Jones and myself, Philip Keeler. Join us each and every Saturday evening for a new podcast to download on trending news stories of the week. We're available to download from around 20 hundred hours British time. Take care of yourselves. See you next week.
We are not responsible for your behaviour. We believe in common sense. The situation on the human rights in the UK is under serious threat from what is now known to be a corrupt Tory government.